See, God called all of us to be a nation of priests. Amen. 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 So this, this message here, Paul is on um, in this letter to the Corinthians, this is um, relevant for all of us so we can understand how to move and operate in the earth and also in the church. Amen. Amen. We have a responsibility to do such things. So the title to this message today will be, um, What Are You Fighting With? Fighting with. See, see, the weapons that Christians fight with are different kinds of weapons. We don't fight the same type of fight that our people in the world fight. Amen. We fight wars different. We fight situations differently. We, we handle situations in a more, more, more biblical way. Why? Because we have um, um, a God that gives us instructions as to how we should operate amongst one another and amongst those who are still out in the world. Amen. And Paul, you know, he had he had this uh this gift. He had this gift to write these letters. He started these churches. Um, he wrote these letters, and, and as he heard what was going on in these churches, Paul began to write about those things, and he began to send those letters to those churches to write the ship. Y'all don't hear me. See, every every spiritual leader has to um, um hold others accountable. That is what we do. Amen. Um, and my brothers, they can test to that. Amen. They, it's, it's, we, have, we have this awesome responsibility that we don't always, I promise you, we don't always want to do it. Why? But God has called us to do these things. And as, um, as, as called men and women, you know, like our sister chapter of of God, we have to do what God tells us to do. And, and, and right through here is where Paul is writing a letter to the Corinthians because he wrote, a, he, in his first letter, he had to rebuke the church. Amen. Oh, Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. He had to rebuke them. Uh-huh. He had to get some things together. They had, they had some things, you know, um, you know, going on in the church that reflected what was going on in society. See, Corinth was a port city. Okay, Corinth was one of those type of cities where anybody was going in and out of that place at any given time. And they, they had some perspectives going on in Corinth. And they had some, some idol worship going on in Corinth. And some of that stuff was seeping into the church in my life. I think I'm in the Bible. Oh, 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 oh. Another thing was going on in Corinth. They had these temples of prostitution. Y'all don't hear me. <laughs> And some of that perspective, you know, they had prostitutes, male and female prostitutes in these temples. And, and some of these men and women from this Corinthian church was partaking in the activities oh, no, hear me, of those temples. So what they was doing was bringing that stuff back to the church. And, and, you, and you found yourself, we, we, we find ourselves with one young man sleeping with his, 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 um, his father's wife. I know kids in here. I know they in here. Um, and Paul had to write the ship on that stuff because that's not how Christians operate. So now Paul comes back in 2 Corinthians and we find ourselves in chapter 10 after he's assessing what's going on in the church after he wrote the first letter. We find ourselves in chapter 10. You know, it was some things he talked about in 2 Corinthians. He talked about uh, um, um, the apostles not needing letters of commendation. Why? Because they were his letters of commendation. How they lived their lives attested to how he lived his life, how he taught the word of God, how he walked in power of the Holy Spirit. Those types of things. You are our letters of commendation. Need a letter. You're my letter. Um, and it's amazing that Paul says that because then he turns around and tells them in preceding chapters that that that, that we don't operate in in a um, in do's and don'ts. Jesus came and he fulfilled the law, and now we walk in love. We obey the law of Moses by walking in love. What is the summation of the law? It is to love God, first five, um, first five commandments, love God, second five commandments, love people. Y'all hear me. Y'all hear me. 
So if you're going to fulfill the law of Moses, you must understand that you are to walk in love for God and one another. Sometimes that gets tricky. Why? Because we're human. And we get on each other's nerves. I know I get on some of y'all nerves. I know I do. You can't tell me I don't. I'm me. I, I get on my nerves sometimes. So I know I get on yours. It's all right, though. Y'all still love me, right? I, I love you. I love you, baby. Love you. So now Paul gets to this place where you have you have certain people in the church thinking that Paul is not as, as can I, how can I say this? He's not as hard as he is in person as he is in these letters. Well, you talk big stuff in these letters, Paul, but when I see you in person, you don't have nothing to say. It, it's, it's almost like cyber bullies, right? Of today, you know, people talk a whole lot of trash online, but when you see them in person, they dug and dodge and they don't want to speak. They go the other way. Y'all hear me? I guess I'm just cyber I hear I hear the guy got so mad at me the other day. He called me a fake preacher and told me he was gonna kill me. I started laughing at him. <laughs> Worried about you, man. <laughs> then I told him, I still love you, brother. I understand you, man. I was talking about LeBron James. He ain't like that. He got mad at me. Called me a fake preacher. <laughs> told me I'm going to hell because I'm biased with Michael Jordan. I said, My God, man, you really laid it on thick, ain't you? Let you have that one, brother. Let you have that was interesting. Then I started telling people, man, I got a price on my head. Man, I go back home, I'm going to get killed. That brother mad, I'm talking about the brown All right, let's get back to this thing. But that's the point. Like, people really are, are bold to do those things, but if I was to really go home, I wouldn't find him nowhere. Now, what if I really walked in the flesh? You know, what if I really, what if I really acted like the old James Gladden and went looking for this man? I promise you it'll be a long day. And then I promise you I can make a phone call right now. If I, I'm telling you, if I wanted to do those types of things and live in the flesh, I could do that and he would be done. But guess what? I'm a child of God. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to forgive you, brother. I love you still. I can see you today. I'm going to give you a hug. If you need something, I'm going to take care of your need. Why? Because I don't operate in the flesh anymore. So I just chop it up as you was a little bit excited. But let's get into this word. It says in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 5, it says, it says Now I, Paul, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. Now he's being sarcastic here now. Don't get it twisted. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence. So he says, but I beg of you, that I beg you that I may not be bold when I see you. Well, if I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walk according to the flesh. We don't walk according to the flesh anymore. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Then it says, verse 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. It's, it's, it's a tricky thing. It's a tricky thing when you're dealing with people sometimes and, and you're a believer. Um, um, God has called us as believers to be the measure by which the rest of the world is supposed to live. And because of that, we find ourselves oftentimes holding people accountable without even saying anything at all, to be, to be honest with you. But then second of all, when we do say something, then people want to get out of pocket with us as if we are the enemy, and we are not. God has called each and every priest in this room 
to hold those accountable that are not doing the things that God has called us to do. Now look, I can even take it deeper in the church because, the, because Paul is telling the church business right now. We're not even going to talk about the world. We're going to talk about church business. Even in the church, Paul has a responsibility and his duty description dictates that he holds believers accountable to do the right things. And because of that, people are mad at Paul because in Paul's letters, Paul is a little bit more abrasive than most. See, this is Paul's leadership style. Paul establishes a church. He stays there a couple of years. He establishes leadership, and Paul leaves and goes do the same thing over again somewhere else. But in that, Paul still has the responsibility by God to ensure that that ministry is running like a fine-tuned engine. Because, because you got to understand, when leaders leave and go do things, when, when church leaders leave and go do things and they leave others in charge, craziness starts taking place in the body. Now, y'all are quiet, but that's okay. Crazy things start happening in the body. And it's not, we have to understand something, it's not the person who's acting out. It is the enemy that's influencing the person that's acting out. It's the enemy. So as believers, we have to understand when we're dealing with one another who is who it really is that we're fighting. We're not fighting each other. We're fighting those demonic forces in higher places that exalt themselves and want to move over us. Why? Because a believer cannot be a believer cannot be um cannot be filled by demon, demon demonic spirits. But believers can be tormented and influenced by the devil. Our behaviors can be, can, be, can be influenced by demonic forces. If we allow ourselves to be used in that way, God, God, the devil will use you in that way, and he will try to bring down and wreak and re havoc in the house. Amen. And let me tell you something. I'm not talking about a particular person. I'm talking about all of us. Why? Because if I allow it, the enemy can from where I stand right now. So I ain't talking about a person. I'm talking about all of us. We need to get ourselves in check, amen? Why? Because if we don't get ourselves in check, somebody needs to come and talk to you and get, your, get you some act right in you. Oh, I even need accountability. I want it. You know why? Because I'm getting too old to be backtracked. I want to do what God called me to do and go to heaven, man. I don't have time to be retaking tests over and over again. Because as believers, when we act out and we do things that God did not call us to do, you it may be two seasons from here, and here it is, you back in a situation where you failed the test, and you got to take it over again. I don't want to be 50 years old still trying to do the grace test. Oh, Y'all don't hear me. Y'all don't hear me. This is a test. All of us are here to learn something. And what I'm here to learn may be different from what you're here to learn, but I should be helping you learn so you can move on. And this is what Paul is doing. So Paul is saying, y'all, yeah, my, my, my letters are a bit bold. And when I get in front of you, yeah, I, I, I'm a little meek when I'm in front of you. But the letters is to get you straight before I come, because if I come and you still not have not done what I told you in those letters, you about to really feel it. Paul wasn't scared of him. Come on. <laughs> Paul was trying to edify him. Paul wanted them to go to a higher level in life. Paul wanted them to be able to operate in the calling that God was calling the Corinthians to, and to do that, he had to be hard on them sometimes. See, 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 then and now, see, even now, when, when, when leaders are a little bit tough on you, 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 you think we're picking on you, and that's not what it is. As a leader, I want you to be great. <laughs> I want you to do what God has called you to do. I want, I want you to be able to function in areas that you didn't even know God told you you was going to function in, because when God showed you a piece of your calling, he don't show you the whole thing. And it's going to be little surprises along the way that God gives you if you stay focused. So my job is to help you discover those things. Their job is to help 
you discover who you are in Christ Jesus so you can be everything God called you to be. So when you die, you won't, but when you lay on your deathbed and you take your last breath, you can be, you can, you can have a clear conscience and know you did what God called you to do. That's our role in that, man. And it don't matter how young or how old you are, you can get started right now. And Paul is saying, yes, I'm bold. Yes, I do these things. Yes, I write these letters this way. Oh, yes, I can do this in person, but I don't want to. Why? Verse 3, but we don't walk in the flesh. See, see that verse 3, I'm on that verse 3, Minister Levine. You know why? Because it, it talks to me about, about emotional intelligence. You know, it, it talks about, it speaks to me about the emotional quotient. Why? Because I can't, I can't, I can't operate like I used to. Like, see, when I first started out in ministry and people was acting crazy, I used to punch them in the mouth. I ain't lying. Like, I really did. I was rough around the edges, man. I was like, somebody do something, I'm ready to, to go after them. God had to work on me for a long time. That's what I'm trying to help you. God had to work on me for a long because I wouldn't be able to stand here right now if God didn't work on me because I can't do that right here. I can't operate like that. I gotta operate in love at all times. Like even, even the unlovable, I gotta love the unlovable all the time. It is all about love all the time. And when you educate people, it's all about educating and love all the time. Like you can't just talk to people and do people any old kind of way. And people, and, and God, and the Paul is saying this right here in verse 3. We don't walk after the flesh. Like, I don't come for you how you come for me. See? Because there's different types of weapons. And check this. So we're going to go to verse 4 and then we're going to hit the first point. It says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, we talked about point one. We can't handle situations in an ungodly way anymore. That is not what God has called us to do. The brother went off on me, cursed me out, called me a fake preacher. I can't go after him. So my defense mechanism was to laugh, right? Because why? Why did I laugh? Because it kept my temperament where it needed to be. So what do you do when you get angry? How, how do you manage that anger? Oh, y'all don't hear me. How do you manage your emotions? God gave us emotions for a reason, but we have to manage those emotions in any given situation to get the best possible outcome. So Paul is saying here, I can get mad, I can go off, I can be out of the flesh, but I don't worry after that no more. See, I don't mature. I don't, I don't came up in my life. God done showed me some different ways to handle business. So I'm going to do it God's way and not mine. Why? Because if I do it my way, I'm destroying everything. <laughs> I'm knocking all this stuff over. <laughs> if I handle it my way, but I can't handle it my way. So it, it, it speaks to that EQ. And, and let's talk about that EQ a little bit more. Those amygdala hijacks in your brain, the amygdala. So that's the, the amygdala is, is the uh, part of your brain when you want to go into defense mechanism. When you want to go into defense mode and you want to fight for yourself, you get these amygdala hijacks in your brain and it causes you to fight. You got to manage that. You got to manage the amygdala, man, because I'm telling you, if you submit to it, oftentimes you're going to destroy opportunities for yourself. I'm trying to help you. God is saying you got to have an even kill. Proverbs 15 and 1 is a weapon. Oh, y'all, y'all. Uh-huh. A soft answer turned away wrath. But grievous words stir up anger. That's Proverbs 15 and 1. You got you to do part A, a soft answer. And this is what Paul is trying to do here. Hey, when I come, I want to come and give a soft answer. So that's a weapon. So, so we cannot handle things in an ungodly way. Now let's go to point two. I want to go to point two because it's important that we go to point two. And it says, as believers, we do not use the same tactics, techniques, and procedures as those who are still walking in the flesh. We have our procedures in the word of God how to deal with one another, how to operate with one another, how to walk in love. How do you do that? How do you do that? It's all right here. You got to read it to know it. Yeah, Y'all got quiet on that. See, don't wait till Sunday to get in the Word of God. Man. See, that ain't enough. That, that's not enough. Don't, don't wait till Wednesday night Bible study. Don't, don't
pressure situation with somebody that, that you're not having a, a good relationship with, you know what to draw from. But if you're walking around on a corner tank of gas, Mr. Levine, you're going to have time today. <laughs> Sometimes I have time. But I'm trying to get to a place where I don't have time today. <laughs> I don't want to have time. I don't want to have time. All I want to do is love you regardless of what the situation is. We can resolve it in a good, in a good, godly, wholesome way. That is what it's about. That is what it's about. So what are my weapons? My weapons, of course, we talked about is love. One of my other weapons is prayer. One of my other weapons is fast. Let's talk about Let's talk about fasting. Why? Because some demons only come out by fasting and prayer. If you've been praying about something for years and, it ain't and, and, and you got no results yet, you need to add some fasting to that prayer. <laughs> you need to sacrifice something. Like I've never participated in lit my whole life. It's more of a high church thing for me. But I'm participating in lit and I cut meat. Why? Because it's some, it's some demonic activity intensifying around my life. And I'm like, you know what? I got you. I got you. Praying ain't been doing it. Guess what? We're going to sacrifice something. We're going to sacrifice something. You're going to stop playing with me. I ain't got time for that. See, I'm like, Paul, the demons know me. Oh, y'all don't hear me. We talked about it, right? I talked about it to somebody. Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. But who are you? When you, when you pray up, up against demonic forces, are they asking who you are or are they fleeing? But you can get there through fasting and prayer. When demonic forces intensify, you intensify. You fast, you pray. Huh? That person is antagonizing you the most, get on your knees at the altar and pray for that person. That's how you fight in the spirit. Same one of the sermons I get. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, we have to learn how to fight the right way. Amen? So let's check out point three. Point three is this. And this is important, right? This is important. As believers, we must ensure that our imaginations do not come into conflict with the word of God. Our imaginations oftentimes run wild. And our imaginations and, uh, 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 play, uh, put movies in our minds and have us thinking in ways that have us 100% off of what's really going on. And then you will start functioning in the way that you think. And then what you think will start manifesting in your life. And that reality, that, that imagination becomes your reality because you manifested that reality on your own because you did not, you did not manage your imaginations with the word of God. You allow with your imaginations to take you instead of you getting into the word of God and finding out what God is saying about the situation. You go into your imaginative thoughts and you and you and that takes precedence over your life over the word of God and what God is actually doing in your life with the situation that you're in. And every time we go with our imaginations and not the word of God, we find ourselves in a, in a, in a, in a place where we don't need to find ourselves in only if we would have brought that up against the word of God and allowed the word to take precedence. See, we don't understand the power of the mind. We don't understand the power of the mind. The Bible says, whatever man thinketh, so is he. Oh, man, look. Whatever a man thinketh, or a woman, because it's women in history month, whatever a man or woman thinks, so is he or she. If you think a certain way, that's how you are. Come on. So now, how do we change that? Come changing our thinking. How, when we have those ungodly imaginations, how do we do that? Throw that imagination away and go into the word of God and get a new one. <laughs> you got to manage those imaginations because imagination, look, imaginations will have you messed up. They have you messed up. That's why he said casting down imaginations because you're thinking I'm trying to be one way and I'm not. <laughs> I'm just trying to do what God said, dude. This is what Paul is saying. I'm not trying to come up against you. All I'm trying to do is hold you accountable to 
Do what God said do so you can thrive. If you look down into the text a little bit more, like around 7 to 8, it will tell you Paul talking about bragging about his authority. And when he talks about bragging about his authority, he said, I don't brag um, just to be bragging on myself. I brag because God gave us this authority for your edification. <laughs> I'm in authority for you, not me. Come on now. God put us in authority in this world for the world, not us. God put us in authority for the world's benefit, not ours. <laughs> Although we do benefit from it because we are laborers and co-laborers in the kingdom of God and God takes care of his people. It's the only reason we benefit because we work for him. Come on. <laughs> Any good CEO don't pay his employee. That's why when you managing God's stuff, you thought it was yours. Then you thought that Mercedes Benz was yours. No. The only reason that you got that Mercedes Benz is because you find yourself being faithful over the pinto that you had. <laughs> and God elevated you to a bend. You was faithful over that apartment that you was living in. You kept it clean. You made the bed. You washed the dishes. You did those things. You paid the rent. You paid the light. And God elevated you to a house. So what am I saying? When you work for God, he gives you increased responsibility and blesses you on top of that. That's all I'm saying. So for your edification, for the world's edification, we do these things and God rewards us for it along the way. Amen? Now, we talked about point four. I'm going to get y'all out of here early today. We talked about point four already, kind of right, because those imaginations will manifest in your life. We talk about all these different religions and they talk about manifesting things, right? That came from God. Manifestation comes from God. It, 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 come, it comes from God. God is the one that gives us the authority to manifest things. Why? Because God calls things into existence and God made us into his image. Therefore, whatever God has done, we can do. So if we call something into existence, it happens. Huh? It can happen. That's why we have to watch what we say. And on top of that, human beings, 80% of the time, think negative. So any negative thought you have quickly manifests itself because you have more faith in the negative thought than you do in a positive thought. So how do we flip that? You got to train yourself with the word of God to start thinking better. Having better imaginations. Why? So you, so you can immediately receive positive results versus negative. got to be intentional about what we're doing, amen? We need each other, amen? We need each other to make this thing the way it's supposed to be in the kingdom of God. I can't do this by myself and don't want to. <laughs> amen? I'm not the most talented man in the room. I promise you that. I don't have a lot of talent. All I, all I am to God is a devil. That's it. I ain't never been this extraordinary athlete. I, I, everything, even preaching. You, you don't know how many hours I stay up studying because I'm not the best preacher in the room. Solomon is, amen. <laughs> no, I'm not. And even 
Christian and not a carnal Christian, you have to spend time with God. You're not going to become better spending time with me, even though I love spending time with you. I'm telling you, it's really going to take you to get before God and let him do surgery on you for you to be the person that God has called you to be. That's how it works. I'll tell you, becoming a chaplain really has caused me to understand that like, if I don't, if I don't spend time in God's word every day, I'm toast. <laughs> I don't know about my brothers, but I'm telling you. Now, if I don't spend time in God's word, I'm toast, man. Because so much, man, so much craziness come my way in a 24-hour period. Y'all wouldn't even believe the crap. The stuff that I deal with on a 24-hour period, I'm telling you. And, and I mean, the enemy just pop up from anywhere. It's getting to the point that when I see people acting crazy, I tell yeah, that's the devil right there. I don't even look at the person no more. It's the enemy. <laughs> so I just get to praying like I know. I'm serious. Like I don't, I don't look at people no more like that. It's like when Jesus and Peter, when Peter said, when Jesus told them he was going to die, and Peter said, no, um, no, no, sir, it's not going to happen. And Jesus said, Satan, get behind me. He wasn't even rebuking Peter. He was rebuking Satan. <laughs> he don't look beyond that. It went straight to the spirit. That's how we got to get with this stuff, man, because I'm telling you, I'm telling you that the devil is busy and the enemy does not. What am I trying to say, Grace? You won't notice. You won't notice. The devil sees what you're doing. He sees the great things that's happening in your life. He sees the great things that's taking place in this ministry. And the devil is busy. Okay? Let's just be honest about it. The devil don't mess with people that don't do nothing significant. The devil does not mess with people that do nothing insignificant. If you are insignificant, he don't worry about you. If craziness is going on in your life right now, it's because you're doing something awesome for the kingdom of God. And if the enemy is that scared of you, come on, man. What can you really do if you tap on and lock on into what God really wants to do? <laughs> That's why it's important for us to stay focused as a congregation, individually and collectively, because God is taking us higher. I, I've been saying this since January, man. I'm not playing. God is taking this place higher. The people in here higher, opportunities is going to come your way, and the enemy is mad about it. You can't tuck your tail and run. You got to stand up and fight, man. <laughs> you got to stand up and fight. Now think about all the things you've gone through in your life and you at this point in your life right now. Think about the past victories that you've had in your life. Think about some of the things that you've gone through in your life and you didn't think you were going to make it. But you sit right here in this conversation right now. been in situations where I knew I was about to die. I knew it. I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tell my wife I love her. <laughs> I'm about to transition. <laughs> I'm, I'm dead serious. Still standing here. Why? Because God has a plan. God has a plan for this place. And we got to stay focused. We got to stay focused. We got to love each other for us to get there. Even when I'm getting on your nerves, Sister Deborah, you gotta love me anyway. Okay? All right, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. We gotta love each other, man. We gotta do it. It's important. Man, y'all ready for me to be done? Huh? Look, let me tell you, I'm gonna give you one more thing as I close. I want y'all to understand something. We love y'all. I'm telling you. <laughs> man, I'm telling you, I don't care how old and young you are. I'm praying that God does something in your life that he's never done before. And let me tell y'all something else. I'm fasting and praying for that. Fasting and praying that God does something in your life that he has never done before. Because I want you to know for sure that he is real. That's the only reason I want him to do it to you. Because I want you to know for sure, without a shadow of a doubt, 
God is real and God is paying attention to you. So if you're going through anything right now in your life and you're feeling the pressure of the kingdom of hell, I want you to come to the altar so we can pray with you. I want you to come up here so we can pray with you. Because I believe in elders of the church.